Good afternoon, all the people from Brookswood. Um, it's a little unusual to be greeting you right here in the out of doors instead of walking into the church where we would meet each other on Sunday mornings. And I'm missing that, and I'm sure you are too. Um, it was just recently, last week, I was reading in um, one of the epistles, and the Apostle Paul was saying, greet this one and that one and and how important it was that we keep greeting each other and I got to thinking about that God gave room in the epistles not just for doctrinal teaching but for encouragement and that's what Paul was doing he was trying to encourage us and so today that's kind of what I want to do for you it's just give you some encouragement for um, the days that we have ahead I really miss seeing all the people there at Brookswood. And uh, I was thinking about what we're experiencing. And it made me, it reminded me that there was a storm, but Jesus was with them in the storm. And so whatever's happening right now, we know that Jesus Christ is with us and uh, in this storm that we're experiencing. Thank you for listening to me, and, and have a good week ahead of you. Hey guys, it's your summer interns here. I'm Vienna. I'm Ben. And I'm James. Um, and here are your announcements. This Sunday, August the 9th at 6.30 p.m., we have a town hall meeting uh, on Zoom, to which there will be a link in the weekly church email. It'll be a great place to connect and discuss what church this fall will look like. And over the next two weeks, Pastor Sean and Pastor Pam will be taking their vacation days. So if you need anything or have questions about the church, you will be uh, contacting Pastor Tom and he will take care of you. I'd also like to take this moment to thank everybody who's been giving so faithfully over the last couple of months. We know this has been a financially hard time for many and we do appreciate every contribution. Um, I'd like to remind you of the three different ways you can give. You can give at the office, either by dropping off a check or by using the debit machine. And you can give online at brookswoodbaptist.com slash give. Um, once again, we appreciate every contribution. And finally, um, Brookswood is trying to put together a upgraded tech team to try to push our online services to the next level. So we're looking for people who are willing to help with filming and editing footage and also help with an online and social media presence. So if you'd be at all interested in um, helping with that or learning how to help with that, um, please contact Pastor Tom and he can help um, get you connected to find a way to contribute in that way. Over the past few weeks, we have loved being able to connect with your kids and teach them about how Jesus is the foundation of their lives. I want to thank parents for uh, just giving your kids to us, that you were accepting that we were doing this camp, especially in this crazy time, and that you just allowed us to connect with them. I want to thank Hannah and Bethany, who helped us with registration, which made a big difference, and we were able to uh, be more involved with the kids. Uh, we hope to see your kids next year, and we are so happy that they were able to come and we were able to see them even through this crazy time. Let's continue with our worship. And bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like now.
everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. afternoon, Brookswood Church, depending on when you're watching this. Nice to be back with you again. We've had uh, some great weeks with our kids' camps these uh, about the past four weeks and uh, had a, an amazing participation, uh, good spirit here. All the kids were working hard. It's joy to see the building used. Actually, it's nice to hear noise in the building again. It's been a while since we've had that. And now August is going to be a little bit of an off month with uh, some of our staff taking their vacation times. So any questions or concerns you have, send directly to me, and I'll be able to take care of those as Pashawn and Pam will be uh, gone for a few weeks. Do pray for us as we continue to seek God in the direction our church needs to go to, con- to uh, be involved in our community uh, and our neighborhoods, as well as to care for the membership. Tonight, we're going to be having a town hall, as uh, you've heard already, 6.30. Hit the link button on the email that was sent out to you and join in. We're going to just discuss a little bit about what's going on in your world, what our church uh, is doing currently. 
a little bit about the future plans that we have. I'd like to bounce some ideas off of you, get your input as well, and pray together uh, as, a, as a church. We've missed, missed those times of coming together. I'm going to continue today in my series of questions from the congregation, and this, this week's question has been a challenge for me. Uh, it's going to be more of a doctrinal or a theological bent today, a lot of scripture references. So I'm not actually going to post all the verses on the screen because there's quite a few. I am going to post the references at the screen so you can look it up as we go or write them down and follow up later on if you want to read more about the topic. So the topic today is, is one that I've actually personally wondered about for a long time, and probably many of you have too. The question is, uh, if believing in Jesus Christ is the only way to achieve salvation— how did people in the Old Testament get saved? They lived thousands of years uh, before Christ came, before his sacrifice on the cross. How were they saved? Were they saved differently than the people in the New Testament? Was there some kind of transaction or interaction between Christ and the Old? We're going to look at that today because it's important to know the role of Jesus Christ in salvation. And is there another way? Are there two ways to be saved or three or four ways to be saved in the Bible? So looking in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 22, God says this, I invite the whole world to turn to me and be saved. I alone am God. No others are real. I have made a solemn promise, one that won't be broken, and everyone will bow down and worship me. They will admit that I alone can bring about justice. Everyone who is angry with me will be terribly ashamed and will turn to me. God says, if you want to be saved, turn to him in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, book of Acts, the Apostle Peter, speaking of Jesus, says in Acts 4.12, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men which, by which we must be saved. And Jesus himself says in John 14.6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, he says. Jesus was looking back, uh, looking ahead at what was going to be accomplished on the cross. Peter was looking back at what Christ did on the cross. Both of them came to the same conclusion, you can't be saved apart from Christ's sacrifice. So the New Test Testament seems pretty clear that Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the promised one, the Lamb of God, has been assigned by God the exclusive ability to offer salvation and forgiveness for sins because of his sacrifice on the cross. No one else died for our sins. No one else defeated the power of sin and death. No one else was raised from the dead. No one else uh, can defeat the power of, of death and disease, the demonic, and, the, and have power over the natural laws, as Jesus did. He stands alone in history as the only one who has accomplished all of these things. So on the surface, there seems to be a bit of a problem. New Testament says Christ is the only way. Old Testament says have faith in God. Well, we wonder about these people in the Old Testament. Maybe it was because of their good deeds that they were saved. Maybe because they obeyed God as Abraham did or Isaac or Jacob. They obeyed God. Moses obeyed God. Maybe obedience was the way of salvation. Maybe they were simply chosen by God. They were the super elect or the divinely chosen ones and were given salvation. Well, Hebrews 11 brings to mind a lot of people in the Old Testament that God declared to be righteous. It's known as the Hall of Faith, chapter 11 of Hebrews, where dozens of people are referenced. And everyone is declared righteous by God. Abraham, Noah, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, and Sarah, all listed. And it was their faith that God credited them uh, as righteousness. They believed, and because of their belief, they acted on their faith. And there isn't a mention of Jesus in this passage. What's going on? If maybe God can declare people righteous, but do they still need to believe in Jesus? The one thing that all of these people had in common in the book of Hebrews, and even into later times that Hebrews references, is that they had faith in God, and they acted on their faith. In other words, their actions showed that they believed God was a God of promise, a God of future, and a God of hope. Furthermore, um, what was the point of the Old Testament sacrifices 
All these thousands, maybe millions of animals were sacrificed for people's sins. If they still needed Jesus to be saved, how how did they actually get forgiveness of sins if you're saved only by believing in Christ? Fortunately for us, the apostle Paul and Peter, the writer of Hebrews and Jesus, uh, are going to shed light on these questions today as we delve into the Scriptures. So in chapter 4 of the book of Romans, Paul uses the Old Testament to point out that salvation has always been forever by God's grace through faith and can only be received by uh, God's uh, gift to those who believe in him. Romans chapter 4 verse 1 and following, it says, well then, what can we say about our ancestor Abraham? If he became acceptable to God because of what he did for example, his works, then he would have something to brag about. But he would never be able to brag about it to God. The scripture says Abraham believed God, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. Verse 5, those who depend on faith, not on deeds, who believe in the God who declares the guilty to be innocent, it is this faith that God takes into account in order to put them right with himself. Further in the New Testament, 1 Peter 1, 8 and following says, You love him, although you haven't seen him. And you believe in him, although you do not see him now. So, since, so, uh, so you rejoice with a great and glorious joy which words cannot express, because you are receiving the salvation of your souls, which is the purpose of your faith in him. He's encouraging believers to, to take joy in their salvation, to recognize that they, they're getting now what, what they can't even see. The intangible has become real in their heart. And he continues, he says, um, it was concerning this very salvation that the prophets made careful search and investigation. And they prophesied about this gift which God would give you. They tried to find out when the time would be and how it would come, and this was the time to which Christ's Spirit in them was pointing in predicting the sufferings that Christ would have to endure and the glory that would follow. Verse 12, God revealed to these prophets that their work was not for their own benefit, but for yours. As they spoke about those things which you have now heard from the messengers who announced the good news by the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. These are things which even the angels would love to understand. In other words, the prophets of the Old Testament were pointing to salvation that was going to happen. They would never see it themselves. It was, it was, a, it was a, a, like a dream or a vision of something in the future that would happen. And they rejoiced, but they knew that they weren't going to be able to participate themselves. They wouldn't, it wouldn't be in their time. It would be our time. It would be the time for us to, to find the, the promise coming true. Tim Keller says, saving faith is not just believing that God is there. Further, it is not believing in a God who saves. It is believing God when he promises a way of salvation by grace. When God declares someone righteous, it's because of his grace and because of our faith. It's it's an interchange. Our belief triggers his grace and offers us salvation. The prophets, the men and the women of the Old Testament were trusting in a God they knew And they were trusting that God would save them and even had a glimpse of what would bring about that salvation maybe thousands of years later. And they knew about a star. They knew about a child that would be born. They knew about a suffering servant who would be hung in a tree. But it was like an incomplete puzzle. They, they, They saw a vague understanding, an outline of what God was up to, but it wasn't quite clear. Not until Christ came, and began to explain why he came and what his mission was, uh, was the puzzle completed, a more um, accomplished understanding of what God was trying to do. But even today, even the New Testament, we, we still aren't quite seeing a clear, complete picture because that only happens when we get to, to see him face to face. We, together with the prophets of old, the faithful people of old, men and women of, of ancient times who had faith in the same God over, that has come to, to meet with us, we together will be able to see him face to face and everything will be made clear one day. So our faith in God is the same as Abraham's faith in God, except that we have a more complete understanding of salvation, that it's because of Christ's sacrifice and death and resurrection that we can be saved. Abraham believed that God would send salvation, and we believe that God has sent salvation. They look forward to the cross, and we look back 
to the cross. The direction is different, but the focus is the same. It's, it's the salvation that occurred uh, in the middle of time with Christ in the center. So Abraham believed in God and his promise that he would become a father of a nation. He believed that all nations on earth would be blessed because of what God would do through his descendants. Back to Romans chapter 4, verse 16 and following, Paul writes, And so the promise made to Abraham was based on faith, in order that the promise should be guaranteed as God's free gift to all of Abraham's descendants. In other words, the promise he made to Abraham is going to be applied to all the future generations. Not just to those who obey the law, but also to those who believe as Abraham did. That's you and me. For Abraham is the spiritual father of us all. He may not be the physical DNA father as he was to the Jewish nation of us Gentiles or non-Jews, but he is the spiritual father because we have the same faith in the same God that Abraham had. His faith did not leave him and he did not uh, doubt God's promise. His faith filled him with power and he gave praise to God. That's why Abraham, verse 22 through faith, was accepted as righteous by God. So all those people in Hebrews 11 believed God's promises to them and acted upon them. They based their life on God's promises and lived by faith in the God who had called them. So today's salvation that we have in modern times is still based on faith given by grace. Romans 10, 9, if you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by our faith that we are put right with God. It is by our confession that we're saved. So it's always been on the basis of faith in God that people are saved, right from the beginning. The second thing we need to understand is that in God's eyes, there's no difference between Old Testament and the New Testament. It's, it's a continuous story. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a motion from Genesis to Revelation is, is, is seamless. There isn't a break, a separation, a gap between the Testaments and Him. He has purpose from the very start to offer salvation to those who would believe in Him. The New Testament is a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies it's what the Old Testament was pointing to all along. The reality and the concept of a Messiah, the Christ, a Savior, permeates the entire Bible from the beginning to end. Speaking to some of his followers on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection, Jesus said this in Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 44. These are the words which I spoke to you while I was with you, that all things must be, put, uh, must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and the prophets and the psalms concerning me, he says. And he opened their eyes and their understanding that they may comprehend the scriptures or understand what would have been written about him all along. And he said to them, this, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. This text is loaded with gospel significance given by Jesus to his disciples, he referenced the law of Moses speaking about him. He referenced the prophets testifying about him. He also showed that he could be found throughout the Psalms. David, amazing descriptions of Christ, the suffering servant, one who would come uh, and die on a cross, one that would rule all, be glorified. It's incredible the pictures that these Old Testament characters were painting of Jesus and they would never see him. From the beginning, the scriptures spoke of the necessity of his suffering, his resurrection, his call to preach, repentance for the forgiveness of sins. One last text uh, that speaks about these things took place before Jesus' actual incarnation on earth in Acts chapter 3, verse 18. Peter preaches this. He says, But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins can be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ, who has preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began, he says. Believe in Jesus and God will send him to you. He's been foretold since the world began, says Peter. 
From Abraham to Moses to David through the prophets, the primary message of the Bible is about a Savior coming to suffer, to die, and then to be resurrected and glorified. Were there multiple ways of being saved prior to the coming of Jesus? No. Paul says in Romans 4, salvation has always been by God's grace received through faith. The idea of a Savior has always been present as well throughout the Scriptures. Even from Genesis 3, which promised a, a, a descendant of, of Eve would crush the head of Satan. The, in chapter 3 of Genesis, a prediction of what was going to happen in Revelation, the last book of the Bible. It's tied together. So, okay, pastor, we get it, we understand salvation is by grace, through faith, but what, what, what's about, about Christ's death? How, how did that impact people that were born and lived and died thousands of years earlier? Well, I believe that we don't really see the totality of salvation as God's uh, followers. We see uh, as much as he allows us to see but it's, it's fascinating that uh, everything that he showed his people in the Old Testament has been fulfilled in the New Testament. We get to see more and more and more. It's like progression of knowledge that he reveals to his people throughout the ages. And we don't even see it all, as I said earlier, but, but there's a fascinating picture that comes in the Old Testament. So what, what I understand through the research that I've been doing is that Christ's sacrificial death and resurrection makes salvation possible for everyone, to those who came before him and to those who came after him. God knew from the beginning what it would take to deal with sin, and he applies the blood of the Lamb on the cross of Calvary to all those who believe in him, just as he applied the blood of the Lamb on the doorposts of the slaves in Egypt to, to save those people from the angel of death. There's always been a consistent message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, from Noah's day to Moses' day through God's prophets and was the very same message that Jesus came to give his very first sermon. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Do you see from the start through the middle to the end the same message, the same uh, plea for God's people, for anyone, to repent and have faith in him in order to achieve salvation? Before Christ came, there was only one way to be saved, by grace through faith in God. After Christ came, salvation was given by grace through faith in God, and his work was accomplished through the sacrificial death of the resurrected Christ. Here's the linchpin. How does Christ's death apply to those in the Old Testament? It comes out of Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. The Jewish law is not a full and faithful model of real things. In other words, it's saying the law that was given through Moses was imperfect. It was only adequate for the time, but it wasn't perfect. There, it was flawed. It's only a faint outline of the good things to come. The same sacrifices are offered forever, year after year in the Old Testament, in the law. How can the law then, by means of these sacrifices, make perfect the people who came to God? In other words, the way you got forgiveness in the Old Testament was through sacrificing, blood sacrifice. Someone had to pay the penalty for your sin. The sacrifices in verse 3 serve year after year to remind people of their sins. But it was never enough. Every year they had to come again and again. And again, verse 4, for the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. The, the blood sacrifices were a, a temporary solution. Verse 5, for this reason, when Christ was about to come into the world, he said to God, you do not want sacrifices and offerings, but you have prepared a body for me. First he said in verse 8, You neither want nor are you pleased with sacrifices and offerings or with animals burned on the altar and the sacrifices to take away sins. He said this even though all of the sacrifices are offered according to the law. I mean, they were doing what he, he expected of them. But it was just a picture of what he was about to do in his son. So in verse 9 he says, Here am I, God, to do your will. 
So God does away with all the old sacrifices and puts the sacrifice of Christ in their place. What a picture. Because Jesus Christ did what God wanted him to do, we are all purified from sin by the offerings that he made of his own body once for all. We, once for all, once for all time and once for all people. The, the impact of the sacrificial system was, was taken and set aside and Christ death and resurrection of the cross was set in its place. It's like now uh, it's been fulfilled. Now what was temporary is now permanent. Now what was uh, for a time, year by year, has become for all eternity. Verse 11, every Jewish priest performs his services every day and offers the same sacrifices many times, but these sacrifices can never take away sins. Christ, however, offered one sacrifice for sins, an offering that is effective forever. Then he sat down at the right side of God, and there he now waits until God puts his enemies as a footstool under his feet. In verse 14, with one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are purified from sin. In other words, Christ on the cross became the sacrifice for all those who would follow him and the sacrifice for all that came before him. To those people in the Old Testament who depended on offering blood sacrifices to achieve forgiveness of sins were forgiven and by grace from God he gave them salvation but not on the basis of animals who died but on the basis of Christ who died for them once for all. The temporary sacrifices held them until a permanent sacrifice was available for them. They anticipated a person who would crush Satan from Genesis A son who would be sacrificed from Abraham and Isaac. A servant who would suffer and die from David. A lamb who would be slain from the Egyptian slaves. A redeemer kinsman from Ruth and Boaz. A glorious king of kings that is victorious from the prophets. And the thread of salvation runs in the Bible from the beginning to the end. How were people saved in the Old Testament? By faith through grace because of the blood of the Lamb on a cross, dying for you and for me. I want to close with Jude chapter 1, verse 1, and it says this. Jude, um, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, two of the ones, listen to these three things, they're the ones called in God the Father, being set apart, I'm going to add, by the Spirit of God, and been kept by Jesus Christ. God calls us He elects us. He has chosen us as his people. The Spirit sets us apart, sanctifies us according to God's plan and God's use. And Jesus, it says, keeps us. They all three have always worked together. He adopts us as his sons and daughters. We're his children. He is our Father. And all three have worked together from the beginning. The Messiah has always been there. The the Christ, the sacrificial lamb, the redeemer has always been throughout the beginning and will be for all eternity. We just didn't see him clearly in the Old Testament, but now we've seen him revealed as the incarnated God, the Son, Jesus Christ, born as a baby in Bethlehem, grew up in, in, in Israel, was sacrificed in Calvary, was resurrected from the from the dead in the tomb and now is seated at, seated at the right hand of God until God says, you know what? It's time. It's time to come back. It's time to finish what we started. You were called, and you were set apart, and God keeps you through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, if you believe in Him, if you have faith in Him, if you want to live a life honoring Him, the promise is yours. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father God, thank you for this message of hope, of revelation, of truth. How you've tied 66 books in the Bible written over thousands of years all said the same thing. They all pointed to your Son. Not only is he the center of everything, he is the beginning and the end. Father God, thank you for your truth, for the people who were faithful to you over the years, over the centuries, the ancients, even though they knew they would never receive what people down in the future would receive, they still were faithful, they still followed you, they still loved you and served you and were rewarded 
for their faithfulness. God, may we too strive to be like them in their faithfulness. May we stand out from the crowd. May we be identified as your followers. May we be the ones that people point to to say, look, it's a faithful one, one who believes. His life shows his belief by what he does and what he says. God, may we be faithful and kept by by your Son for eternity. Come, Lord Jesus, come soon. We want to see you face to face. We want everything to be made clear. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear! The Chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. promise good to me his word my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures my chains are Good to see you guys, but we sure miss getting together at the at the actual church inside. We have enjoyed some outdoor stuff at the church, and that's been great. But truly, we can hardly wait till this is over. However, we know that God's in control, and he has good things for us coming out of this. And so we'll wait on his timing. Hope to see you guys soon. Bye for now.